That's in a bibliography that I passed out, I think, last time. Okay. Monday. Yeah. 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 Okay, um, so this is essentially, for, for those of you who haven't done one before, this is what an annotated bibliography is supposed to look like. Um, you should be thinking about this over the break, right? Like at least, at the very least, kind of start, get like pick, pick a topic and start getting some of your sources together. Um, I demonstrated to the people who were here on Monday how to start searching um, the Galileo databases um, for sources. So um, if you go back and watch the, the beginning of the video from last time, that'll show you what basically what to do. The other thing you can do, and this will probably save you a lot of time and misery in the long run, make an appointment with the reference librarian. What? The reference librarian. His name is John Wilson. You can reach him at john.wilson at gsw.edu. And um, he knows better than anybody else on this campus how to use the library resources to finish an assignment, right? So bring the assignment sheet with you. Tell him what you're looking for. Tell him what it is you're working on. Um, and he'll help you gather sources and yeah this this is probably the easiest way to get the research part of the assignment started right just sit down for 15 minutes with John Wilson and he will have you on your way okay so does anybody have any questions about assignments or anything before we get started Okay, great. So for tonight, right, you're not completely free of this class after the session is over, right? You need to finish Reflection Paper 7 for tonight. And then over the break, if you could read uh, the Terry Tempest Williams essay, The Clan of the One-Breasted Women, and submit three words you had to look up to the vocab folder. Um, and uh, that is the last thing we're going to be reading in Reading the World. And then we are going to be devoting the rest of the semester to various exercises that'll help us get the paper done, right? Okay, so uh, today what I want to begin with is, you know, given kind of where we are in the semester, I want to think for a minute about holidays. And I want you to give me a list of federal holidays. Christmas. Okay, Christmas. And yeah, think specifically about holidays when you are given the day off, right? Thanksgiving. Okay, Christmas, Thanksgiving, yeah. Labor Day. Labor Day. Memorial Day. I didn't get Labor Day off. <laughs> Labor Day, yeah. Um, it de depend, de depends on where you're working at, but like New Year's Day and Labor Day, you're supposed to have off, right? Fourth of July. Memorial Day, 4th of July. Yeah, well, but, but it's on Monday. Yeah, it's Easter but it's, it's usually observed on Monday, right? Yeah. So that you get the still get the day off. So yeah, Easter Monday is usually a day off. Um, heard somebody say New Year's Day, Martin Luther King, Martin Luther King Day, right? Okay, so this is a pretty good list here. Um, now, there are two days on this list that are not like the others. Christmas and Easter. Christmas and Easter, yeah, exactly. Religious. Good, yeah, they're religious holidays. Or at least, you know, whether, you know, whether you're religious or not, right, they are, um, their origins are as religious holidays, right? 
although lots of people who aren't religious still celebrate. The rest of these are all secular holidays. They're often, you know, intended to commemorate a person or event, right? So, <clears throat> if you celebrate Easter and Christmas, right, when you go to your job day to day, you already know you're getting your religious holidays off, right? You don't have to take vacation days, you don't have to take personal days, you don't have to think about it. But that's not for everybody though, because like if you're Jewish or something like that, they have uh -huh. different like I don't know, different days. Yeah. That they have to take off. Yeah, exactly, right? If you're Jewish, you have to take a vacation day for Yom Kippur, right? If you're Muslim, you have to take a vacation day for Eid al-Fatir, right? If you're Hindu, you have to take a vacation day for Diwali. So if you follow a religion that is not the majority religion in the country, then your religious holidays aren't accounted for in the federal holiday calendar, right? You actually have to think about and plan for particular days off. Um, and sometimes, if you're dealing with a boss or a teacher or somebody that is unfamiliar with your religious traditions, they give you a hard time about it, right? Like, you know, for example, my wife is Jewish, and when she was in high school, um, one of her teachers accused all the Jewish kids who wanted to take the day off on Yom Kippur um, of just wanting to go to the mall and eat pizza, which they found particularly offensive because what you actually do on Yom Kippur is sit in the synagogue and fast all day, right? It's, you know, the day of atonement. It's when you're supposed to atone for whatever transgressions you've committed over the course of the year, right? Um, I remember, you know, reading a news story a year or two ago about um, a guy, he was, uh, he was Muslim, and he was just in a Taco Bell drive through during Ramadan, just after sundown. And um, I guess the, uh, the woman in the drive-thru recognized something, something Islamic in his car or something, or you know, on his dress. And she started giving him a hard time about his religion. And he was like, like please lady, like, I just want the burrito. I haven't eaten all day. You know? <laughs> but like, generally, if you live in the United States or somewhere in Europe, and you're a Christian, you don't really have to put up with that kind of shit, right? You know, we have these, you know, arguments, these kind of fake wars over Christmas every year, right, where you're supposed to get offended if somebody says happy holidays to you <laughs> instead of Merry Christmas, right? <laughs> but, you know, that, you know that, that's all that, like kind of fake outrage machine stuff, right? In general, being part of the majority culture and following the majority religion means you never really have to think about any of this kind of stuff because it's already planned into the calendar, right? And the reason that I bring this up is because this is actually kind of directly relevant to some of the arguments Audrey Lord is making, right? That identity is a really complex thing, right? Our personal identities are made up of the interactions of various aspects of you know, our culture groups, our personalities, our professions, even our level of physical ability, right? So for example, if I were to break down right, the various identities that affect the way that I interact with the world, and the world, the way the world sees me, right? Okay, the most obvious two would be that I'm a white man, right? <laughs> All right, I'm in early middle age, I'm 43. All right, professionally, I'm an educator. I have a PhD. I was raised Methodist, but no longer practice. I'm able-bodied, I have no physical disabilities or handicaps. And 
that's an important thing that we often don't think about as well, right? So the world looks a lot different to you if you're looking at it, say, from a wheelchair, right? So, for example, this building that we're sitting in right now, right? I'm guessing that most of you have never known this building without an elevator, right? Never Neither do I. <laughs> but the elevator's always been here as long as you as long as y'all have been here, right? Because you're all new here. The elevator was just put in last year. Yeah. This building was not ADA compliant up until last year. So um, students who couldn't walk easily or couldn't walk at all couldn't get up those stairs. There was a, it's because of the age of the building, there was a legal loophole that we were able to, the administration was able to get away with not having an elevator for a long time. You know, we, we've been complaining, like I've been here now 12 years and we've been complaining about it the whole time I've been here, but they finally put one in last year, yeah. But again, like, you know, it's like, you know, think about, you know, coming to this building. How did you say when people get to class? Then? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. We have, the yeah, there are those classrooms at the bottom of the building. Um, they're inferior to the classrooms up here. Um, the facilities are worse um, and they tend to get more crowded, uh, but they are available. Because those classrooms exist, if somebody can't get upstairs, we just put the class down there, right? Mm -hmm. But it says to you, right, when you come up here, like you're in a wheelchair, and you sit and you look at this building, right, and there's no elevator, no way for you to get upstairs, it says to you that you're not welcome, right? That no one's thought about making any kind of provisions for you. Okay, so we also think about things like politics, right? So politically, I am a European-style social democrat. There isn't really a US party that <clears throat> suits my particular political orientation. Basically, I think we should be more like Denmark. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's my basic politics there, right? Be, be like Denmark. Um, I'm trying to think, what else? What else might I add to this? Okay, yeah. I was, yeah, born into a working class family. My dad was a pipe fitter. My mother's family were dairy farmers. But yeah, my current status, at least given my level of education and my profession, would be middle class. Right, I'm married. And I'm also childless, right? I don't have kids. And that's, I mean, for a married person my age, right? That is something that people often kind of judge you on as well, right? Even like members of my wife's family, when we were in our 30s, were sending her articles um, about declining fertility in women in their 30s, right? And, yeah, well, yeah, because there, there's this strong cultural assumption, right, mm -hmm. that married couples are supposed to have kids. And nobody ever really asks or considers why you don't. <laughs> right? Well, I don't know. Well, <laughs> that's getting a little personal there, right? <laughs> yeah, the, 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 point, the point being, though, right, like, no one thinks twice about a married couple that has, you know, one or more children, right? But people think that sort of thing about a married couple that doesn't. If you don't fit the social norm in some way, you open yourself up to various kinds of judgment. But there are also elements of this identity that give me a lot of privilege, right? That empower me in a lot of ways. So uh, to give you an example of this, I'm just going to tell you a brief um, story from uh, my <coughs> less misspent than it should have been youth. Um, when I was 15, uh, my friend Phil had a Halloween party. And we got bored in his basement, and we just started walking around his neighborhood. Uh, there were about 10 of us. There were 10 of us. Um, six of us were white. Two were Korean, one was Chinese, and the tenth 
was Latina but looked white. There's a cop uh, sitting on his car watching the trick-or-treaters, I guess like he was on silly string and toilet paper duty that night. <laughs> and he was pissed about it. And he was bored. And he sees um, a group of kids that he can mess with, right? So he made some kind of crack about us being too old to be trick-or-treating. And my friend Eddie gave him the finger. And we kept walking. You were 15, you said? Yeah. And 15-year-olds are dumb, yeah. right? Yes. I'm very dumb. So, you know, we, we, we keep walking. The next thing we know, the cop has grabbed Eddie, has put him up against the cruiser, and is searching him. Now, we were all students at the same private high school. Most of my friends were doctors and lawyers kids. A couple of us were scholarship kids. I was one of the scholarship kids. But even though I wasn't one of the lawyers kids, I knew what my rights were. <laughs> and I got into the cop's face, and I started shouting at him about how Eddie hadn't broken any laws, and there's no rule against being rude to a cop. And the cop just told me to shut up and back off and that I was going to be next. But then, after he had sufficiently frightened us, right, he let us go. So, the cop was a dick, right? You still can't do that. Especially to tell lawyers to be <laughs> Yeah, like, like the, so the, the cop was a dick. He was mad about his assignment. He was taking it out on a bunch of kids, right? But we didn't get in any real trouble, right? Now, how might this situation have gone differently if this had been a group of black or brown 15-year-olds? You know my honest opinion? Yeah. I definitely think it would have gone a lot differently. Oh, absolutely. Like, especially, like, uh -huh. George Floyd. Everything. Yeah, one, it would have gone 100%. For one thing, how many of us, would, would any of us have felt quite so empowered to give a cop the finger? Or then to get in the cop's face when he started treating us that way, right? Probably not, right? Because... You'd be all over Twitter but yeah, yeah, like, you know, the, 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 but the point I'm trying to make here, right, is because we were a predominantly white, affluent group of kids, we were able to get away with something that, particularly in that neighborhood, other groups of kids would not have been able to get away with, right? So, <clears throat> here's what I'd like you to do for a minute, right? I want you to just try and like look at these different identity categories that I've kind of set up for myself here, right? And I want you to think about your own identity, the different categories you might break that down into, right? Exactly, yeah, like, yeah. And yeah, if you, if you want to use the kinds of categories that I used here as a template, that will, will probably help you. thing you might all want to think about. Um, if any of you are the first generation in your family to go to college, uh, that is an important one.
We just put stuff like you would get like based off of looking or like just stuff about your speech. Yeah, just the stuff about yourself in general. Not necessarily things that, that somebody would be able to tell just by looking at you, right? Okay. I mean, for what, for example, like you couldn't you couldn't tell what my level of education or my religion would be, right? That would by, by looking at me, right? Which is one of the things I find the Happy Holidays, Merry Christmas debate so bloody ridiculous. It's like, how, how can you tell whether someone is Christian or not just by looking at them? <laughs> you gotta read minds, though. What's that? You gotta read minds, duh. I, I guess, yeah. <laughs> no, I think they mean just based on if you watch what they're doing, not necessarily the Maybe, physical yeah. appearance. Yeah. Did you mm -hmm. not see me not buy a Christmas tree? <laughs> 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 Okay, so has everybody got at least a basic list to work with here? Okay, so I'm going to ask you a bunch of questions and I want you to try to answer them as best you can with the identity categories you've come up with for yourself. Are you going to read these out loud? No, you're not going to have to read these out loud. This is, you know, the, 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 this, this is all, you know, this is personal stuff and, you know, Again, like coming from a Scottish Protestant background, right? The only thing that's, that is more uncomfortable for us than having feelings in the first place is talking about feelings. So. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so first question. The part of my identity that I am most aware of on a daily basis is <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm not entirely sure why that was funny. <laughs> A lot of you seem to find it so. Okay. The part of my identity that I am least aware of on a daily basis is like, what's the part of your identity that you have to think about the least? Part of my identity that was most emphasized or important in my family when I was growing up. <laughs> Can we have the same answer? Yeah. Okay. Okay. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you, 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 yeah. You, you can definitely use the same category for multiple, uh, multiple responses. Again, like, there are some parts of our identity that are just more central to who we are than others, right? The part of my identity that I wish to know more about is blank. Like, is there a part of your identity that you just you, you, you haven't really explored that you wish you had? Not me. <laughs> <laughs> the part of my identity that provides me the most privilege is. <laughs> the part of my identity that I believe is most misunderstood by others is The part of my identity that I feel is difficult to discuss with those who identify differently is, right? What do you have a hard time talking about with people who don't share that same identity? And finally, the part of my identity that makes me feel discriminated against is blank, right? Like, do you feel like there is a certain aspect of your identity that causes people to judge you unfairly? I might have the same answer. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the same answer. Okay. Everybody got something? Mm -hmm. All right. So what I'd like you to do now, instead of just, you know, reading these out, this, again, this is personal, right? I want you to just kind of take seven minutes and I want you to kind of just write a quick reflection on this exercise. And I want, to, I want you to think about what breaking down 
your identity into these elements and thinking about how your identity affects the way you interact with the world. Um, like, is this something that you regularly were thinking about already or did you get anything, get something new out of this?
Take two more minutes. So, once again, I'm just going to say that I'm not expecting anybody is going to read out what they wrote or insisting that anyone read what they wrote, right? But I do hope that at least by this point in the semester, even if we see the world differently, I hope that you at least realize that I mean well by you and would not put you through an exercise that I think would do you any harm, right? Um, so. Is anyone willing to read what they wrote? I don't really care. Okay, yeah, Carmen, go ahead. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, I don't know if I really like did this right. I'm not just trying to scan it. That's what I was I don't know if I wrote this the way I was supposed to write it. <laughs> <There's, laughs> well, and th there isn't really a right or a wrong way to do it. Go ahead. I, put, I feel like I did somewhat get something new out of this exercise, uh -huh. although I've always felt like there was a possibility that I could be discriminated against because of my color. I didn't think about some of the privileges that I did have based off of my class level and being like gifted through school. Or whatever. Okay. And mm -hmm. I put, because I was adopted or whatever, Yeah. I put, I have already um, looked into the fact about being adopted and how uh -huh. It was difficult to discuss with others based because they couldn't really like relate. Sure. That's yeah, that, that, right. That's something that's no doubt really hard to talk about with someone who hasn't had a similar experience, right? And I think yeah, the whole the gifted and talented thing I think is also very like if you're put into a gifted and talented program when you're a kid, right? Then it means that you are kind of like one of those kids in the school that they've decided to invest extra time and resources in, right? So on the one hand, like that, you know, makes you feel special, like you've been picked out, right? But it also kind of pits you against your peers in certain ways, right? All right, good. Anybody else willing to share? Thank you, Carmen. Yeah, Hannah, go um, ahead. I said like I got something different out of this exercise because like when you're asking those questions, like a lot of them were like, you know, how would would someone view you differently or like blah 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 
And I think a lot of the times our mind automatically goes to, well, if you're black or white, you know, this is why people argue, or if you're a Democrat or Republican, like, uh -huh. you know, that's the only cause of controversy. But it's like right. a lot of different things. Like one thing that I did was like, if you're married, like right now, for mm -hmm. some reason, all my friends are getting married. I don't know why, <laughs> but so then like, they're always like, hey, are you getting married, blah, blah, blah. Uh -huh. So like, that's like a big cause of controversy. It's not necessarily like political or, you know, that sure. big, yeah. but it's still very like mm -hmm. controversial. And everything. Yeah, like when, when, when whatever you're doing seems outside of the norm of what the rest of your group yeah. is doing, right? Then people start to question that. Yeah, yeah. good, thank you. Anybody else? Okay, and that's right. Totally all right. Right, that's fine. Right, <laughs> fine, the right way. I feel like just everything we do. I am a female. <laughs> I am. A yeah. Female. Well, and, and it, it's yeah. I mean, you know, but like again, like part. I think part of the point is, and I think like some of you who were reading were, were getting a lot of this, right? Is that when we look at a person, right? You like, you know, we we don't see the whole person when we look at them, right? And Various things about ourselves affect the way that we interact with the world and the way the world interacts with us. And this is actually kind of central to what's going on in the Audre Lorde piece, right? So there wasn't a word for this yet when Lorde was writing. But it's a key text in the development of what sociologists call intersectionality. So intersectionality is a term that's coined in 1989 by a legal theorist named Kimberly Crenshaw. And Crenshaw's basic point is that <clears throat> essentially her argument was with um, previous waves of feminist movements, right? So in first wave feminism, right, you had, you know, the suffragettes of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And those were women who were basically just fighting for, for basic rights, right? The right to vote, the right to own property, um, rights over their own children. Um, but this particular movement was very, very white in its orientation and very, very middle class, right? So for example, a lot of the early suffragettes um, explicitly made the argument that allowing white women to vote would dilute the voting power of black men, right? Assuming that white women would vote the same way as their husbands. So, you know, the first wave feminists often kind of flew, threw women of color directly under the bus. Now, second wave feminism was built around a slightly, this is the feminism of the kind of the 1960s through the 1980s, was built around a different set of cultural assumptions, right? So this kind of originated with women in the suburbs, right? They were mostly college educated. Um, you know, they got married. They had that nice house in suburbia with all the modern conveniences. Um, <clears throat> and you know, then there there they are at home with you know maybe two or three little kids running around, isolated, with no job, with nothing else to do, right? And kind of feeling kind of like empty and unfulfilled and you know like is this it right is this all there is while well, husband still goes off to work in the city every day and the problem that Crenshaw sees with this particular kind of feminism is that it speaks only to the experience of a relatively small subset of women right that it doesn't speak to working-class women it doesn't really speak to women of color um, and in particular um, it also doesn't really speak um, to women of a non-heterosexual orientation, right? 
with its focus on the married, middle-class, suburban white woman. So what Crenshaw was trying to get people to do was consider identity in terms of the way various aspects of our cultural conditioning um, and even physical characteristics interact with each other. Right, that we're more than, that the way we see the world is impacted um, by more than our gender or our color or even our profession, right? That all of these things work together in forming our personalities and our identities. And that if you want to actually make any kind of social progress, then you have to consider people in terms of the way these things intersect rather than um, as you know, simply members of a specific group, right? So, <clears throat> now, the reason I had you do this particular exercise is I think because it actually does relate to a specific uh, metaphor in Lord's piece here. Can we turn to page 155? Somebody please read for me the paragraph that starts with, and of course I am afraid. And of course I am afraid because the transformation of silence into language and action is an act of self-revelation, and that always seems fraught and da with danger. But my daughter, when I told her of our topic and my difficulty with it, said, tell them about how you've never, you've never really a whole person if you remain silent because there's always that one little piece inside you that wants to be spoken out. And if you keep ignoring it, it gets madder and madder and hotter and hotter. And if you don't speak it out one day, it will just up and punch you in the mouth from the inside. Okay, so think. Let's, let's pick this image here apart, right? So what is the daughter describing here? What is Lord's daughter describing to her? Feeling you get when you don't say anything? Okay, yeah, so yeah, specifically, yeah, the, the feeling you get when you leave something unexpressed, right? When you remain silent about something. And I'm sure that most of us have experienced this kind of thing at some point in our lives, right? You know, like we feel like, you know, there was you know, a time when, you know, we should have said something and for whatever reason we didn't, right? You know, when, you know, maybe, you know, someone has disrespected us um, unfairly and we should have stood up for ourselves but didn't because we didn't want to make waves. You know, or maybe you've been in a situation, you know, where a friend makes a racist or sexist joke that you know is wrong, but you don't want to rock the boat or spoil the friendship. So you remain silent about it. Or even something more benign, right? You know, you, you, know, you have a crush on somebody and you, know, you, wanna, you, you wanna go up and tell them, but you're afraid of making yourself vulnerable, right? You're afraid of saying, you know, you know you're, you're afraid of what they might say in response. So you just keep your mouth shut. And what happens when you remain silent here? What is the, what literally does the daughter say happens here? Yeah, it builds up and eventually yeah, it punches you in the mouth from the inside, right? So these silences cause your own body to turn against itself, right? Now, can we think of an illness that basically does the same sort of thing, causes your body to turn against you, your own cells? Cancer? Yeah. What the daughter's describing is kind of like cancer. Right? You get, you know, when you're diagnosed with cancer, right, it means that some cells in your body have mutated, right, and are attacking other cells. Now, if we go back to the beginning of the essay, can I get somebody to, uh, to read for us, starting on page 154? So this is, 
the, the first couple paragraphs discuss the incident that sparked the writing of this essay in the first place, right? So can somebody start reading from page 154? First paragraph. I have come to believe over and over again. I have come to believe over and over again that what is most important to me must be spoken, made verbal, and shared, even at the risk of having it bruised or misunderstood. That the speaking profits me beyond any other effect. There is a lot less being part, and the meaning of all that waits upon the fact that I am still alive and might not happen. Less than two months ago, I was told by two doctors, one female and one male, that I would have to have breast surgery and that there was a 60 to 80 percent chance that the tumor was malignant. Mm -hmm. Between that telling and the actual surgery, there was a three-week period of the agony of an involuntary reorganization of my entire life. The surgery was completed and the growth was benign. Okay, thank you. So what's the incident here that sparks yeah, a tumor. Yeah, she has a cancer scare, right? The doctors tell her that she has a, a breast tumor that's probably malignant, right? And I want to unpack a couple of terms in this paragraph. So first off, what elements of Lord's identity have we already picked up just from what we've read thus far? She says she's black. Okay. Yeah, black woman. She was a novelist too, right? Yep, yeah, she is also a novelist, yeah, although she doesn't specifically mention this in the essay. It but does say in say social introduction, yeah. What else do we know about her already from what we've read? She has a daughter? Yeah, that she's also a mother, right? And what experience can we say she has most certainly had here as well? given this first paragraph. Cancer. Yeah, she's also a cancer survivor, right? How is she a cancer survivor if the tumor was behind? What does that even mean? Or at least she she's or at least she survived a cancer scare anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, she's, she, she survived a cancer scare. And indeed, well, actually, like a, a year after she um, delivered this lecture, she actually did have a, another tumor that was malignant. And that, That's not yeah. That and does malignant mean? Malignant means cancerous. Okay. Yeah, malignant is cancerous. Benign is like it's not really going to do anything. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, benign means it's basically, it's basically harmful. Yeah, well, and, and with, with something like a brain tumor, even a benign one can still put pressure on your brain and yeah. cause problems. Yeah. All right. Uh, so, can I get somebody to continue reading here the paragraph that follows within those three weeks? Within those three weeks, I was forced to look upon myself and my living with a harsh and urgent clarity that has left me still shaken, but much stronger. This is a situation faced by many women, by some of you here today. Some of what I experienced during that time has helped me elucidate. Mm -hmm. For me, much of what I feel concerning the transformation of silence into language and accent. Okay, so yeah, to elucidate means to make clear. Yeah, I looked, that was one of my words. Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what does this cancer scare force her to do or force her to think about? Pardon? Look at the bigger picture. Okay, how, how, how so? Yeah, it makes her consider this relationship between language and action, right? Between speech and action. And what the possible consequences are of keeping silent. Right? in becoming forcibly and essentially aware of my mortality and of what I wished and wanted for my life, however short it might be, priorities and omissions became strongly etched in a merciless light, and what I most regretted were my silences. Of what had I ever been afraid? To question or to speak as I believed could have meant pain or death, 
but we all hurt in so many different ways all the time and pain will either change or end. Death, on the other hand, is the final silence. So what is she saying keeps us from speaking out? What's the thing that stops us from speaking? Fear of pain. Yeah, fear of pain, right? So, you know, much like that, that you know, Benthamite motivator, right? You know, that we, we do things because we desire reward or we fear pain, right? So we keep silent because we fear pain. Right? But what's worse than pain? And why is death worse than pain? Because that's the final Yeah, death is final and inevitable, right? That is, you know, the, the one thing that whatever our identity is, right, we all have in common is that we all come to the same end sooner or later, right? I don't want to you know, start your holiday season here on so morbid a note, but uh, <laughs> you know, but the, you know, this is the basic point that she's making, right? Is that this is you know, that's it, right? There's no there's no chance to speak after that, right? Pain, on the other hand, is temporary. Right, whatever pain you endure by speaking out is eventually going to pass, right? So what's worse than enduring a little bit of pain and making yourself a little bit vulnerable by saying what you believe, by expressing yourself, what's worse than that is never having the chance to get that out, right? She says, like, at the end, that like pain and like you know pain all that is super but like the only thing that immobilizes us is silence uh-huh and yeah I think yeah she's there are a couple there, there's a whole strand here related to silence right so silence is related here right to pain and to death specifically right right to death right silence is passive Right, language, she relates to action. And silence, she also relates pretty specifically to disease, right? She talks about silence kind of in this kind of medical discourse that silence is like cancer and that it eats you up from the inside. Um, and uh, you know, it doesn't let you express, you know, like, like in failing to express yourself, right, you, send, you, you bottle things up that cause you more pain in the long run, right? So, Can I get somebody to read the bottom of page 154? Uh, or you're starting with, um, I was going to die if not sooner than later. I was going to die if Thank not you. sooner than later. Whether or not I had ever spoken myself, my silences had not protected me. Your silence will not protect you. For, but for every real word, for every attempt I have ever made to speak those truths for which I am still seeking, I had made contact with other women while we examined the words to fit a world in which we all believe bridge, bridging mm -hmm. our differences. And it was the concern and caring of all those women which gave me the strength and enabled me to scrutinize the essentials of my food. Okay, uh, can you keep going, please? The women who sustained me through the period were black and white old, young, lesbian, bisexual, and heterosexual, and we all shared a war against the tyranny, tyrannies of silence. They all gave me a strength and concern without which I could not have survived intact. Within those weeks of acute fear came the knowledge within the war we are all waging with the forces of death. So, 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 yes. so mm -hmm. and otherwise conscious or not, I am not only a consultant, I am also a warrior. Okay, casualty, right? I'm a casualty. 
So let's actually start there because I think this is another kind of interesting metaphor. The whole casualty warrior thing, right? She talks a lot about the, like, you know, the, this battle against silence, right? But the, the forces that try to keep her silent, yeah, in kind of in, like in this kind of battle metaphor, right? This kind of war metaphor. What does it mean to be a casualty? Okay, yeah, somebody who's killed or wounded in war, right? <laughs> yeah, a casualty is someone who was killed or wounded in war. Now, in order to be a casualty of war, do you have to have been an active participant? Yes. Right? Uh, no, why, why not, Rendari? Like, who else gets hurt in war? Because, like, people standing in crossfire. Yeah. Innocent bystanders are often killed or hurt, right? You know, um, you know when say you know a, you know a bomb is dropped on a village, you know maybe to root out a nest of enemy or terrorists or whatever, right? There are often going to be people who had nothing to do with with that group who are going to be hurt or killed, right? Um, you know, if the battle happens to be taking place near a village. People from that village may very well be killed or hurt, right? So there are off, there are people hurt in war who are non-combatants, right? However, she says here, I am not only a casualty, I am also a warrior. So what is she trying to emphasize? How is a warrior who's a casualty different from a bystander who's a casualty? Yeah. She's stressing her active participation in a battle, right? She's not just going to be a passive bystander who gets hurt, right? She's hurt, right? Any injuries that she has sustained are because she's been fighting. And so this is, you know, kind of like a way to kind of like speech and action are ways to kind of like take control of your situation, like to, to express what's in you rather than to press it down and kind of let others decide what's okay for you to say and what's not okay for you to say, right? What she's stressing is like to, you know, to be, you know, be a warrior, not just a casualty and take control, right? If you're gonna get hurt anyway, then at the very least, make sure you're in the fight. But I wanted to pay attention to this other discourse that she's got going on here as well, right? She talks about like making contact and bridging differences. And about the various women who sustained her through her cancer scare, right? And then I want to try to connect this to the paragraph at the bottom of page 155. Can I get somebody to read that for us? In my house this year, we are celebrating the Feast of Kwanzaa. In my house this year, we are Thank celebrating you. the Feast of Kwanzaa, the African American Festival of Harvest, which begins the day after Christmas and lasts for seven days. There are seven principles of Kwanzaa for, for each day. The first principle is Umoja. Mm -hmm which means unity, the decision to strive for and maintain unity in self and community. The principle for yesterday, the second day, was, uh, who did you, I can't even say that. Self-determination, the decision to define ourselves, name ourselves, and speak for ourselves, instead of being defined and spoken for by others. Today is the third day of Kwanzaa, and the principle for today is Eugene collective work and responsibility, the decision to build and maintain ourselves and our communities together and to recognize and solve our problems together. Okay, so apart from, so what is it that's giving her the courage to speak and the courage to fight this battle against silence? If we look at the principles that she celebrates in the Kwanzaa holiday and is talked of like, you know, speech allowing her to bridge differences uh, with other women and to make contact with other women. What, 
what does silence do like where does silence leave you? Yeah. If you're silent, right? Whatever suffering you've got within you, right? You're suffering alone if you never express it. You're just bottling it up, you're keeping it in, right? And I think one of the things that she's stressing here is that it becomes easier to speak. If you, and indeed, like speaking out allows you to make contact with other people and share that pain, right? If you are sharing that pain, you are sharing the details of your life, you're sharing the things that you typically don't speak out with others, it helps you make contact and build community so you're not fighting alone. Does this make sense? Everybody with me? Okay, I think um, the last thing I want to focus on here is a question here of audience, right? Who is she talking to here? What's the, who are the people she's speaking to? Okay, yeah, it's a mostly but not necessarily exclusively female audience. So she's speaking on a panel at the Modern Language Association. And actually, like some of these details are, are actually given in the introduction. So the Modern Language Association is a professional association for language and literature professors. So she's speaking here to an audience of teachers and scholars. Becomes important, right? The fact that audience here is. If we look on page 156. Can I get somebody to read the paragraph that starts with "and where the words of women are trying to be heard"? And where the words of women are crying to be heard, we must each of us recognize our responsibility to seek those words out, to read them, and share them, and examine them in our Pertinence. Pertinence to our lives, that we not hide behind the mockeries of separations that we have been that have been imposed on us, in which so often we accept our own. Um, for instance, I cannot, I can't possibly teach black women writing. Their experience is so different from mine. Yet, how many years have you spent teaching Otto or Shakespeare or Proust? Proust, Proust, or other? She has a, she's a white woman. And what could she possibly have to say have to say to me? Or she's a lesbian, what would my husband say or my chairman? Or again, the woman that writes of her sons and I have no children. And all the other endless ways in which we rob ourselves or rob ourselves of ourselves and each other. Okay, thank you. So she's talking here specifically about the texts that people choose to teach, right? about what texts instructors are choosing for their classrooms. And what is she encouraging language and literature professors to do when they're deciding what to teach? She's saying that you can teach other things like other than what you're I don't know, necessarily familiar with or like what you've gone through. Okay. Like we haven't gone through the Shakespearean time, but we still teach it. Yeah. So like exactly. Yeah. Yeah. How, yeah. So yeah. She, she, she's she's yeah. Using these three examples, right? These you know, quote unquote, dead white men specifically, right? Plato, Shakespeare, Marcel Proust, right? As examples of these guys whose texts are taught in just about every literature or philosophy departments in the United States and Europe, but who also you know, lived in lives and societies that are difficult for us, that none of us have any direct experience of, exactly, right? So that 
the fact that you have no direct experience of what someone else has been through doesn't mean that you cannot imaginatively reconstruct their world or sympathize with them in some way, right? And I think part of the argument she's making here is that one of the things that holds us back are social norms. Right, and that we're afraid of angering or upsetting other people. You know, she's like, what, you know, what would my husband think or what would my chairman think, right? If I taught a text that was outside of what they thought was appropriate. That <clears throat> these social norms are imposed on us and intended to frighten us into um, maintaining a status quo. You know, I mean, you know, by, you know, by that, by the logic she describes here, right, I should never have given you a text like this to read. Because, you know, as, again, you know, a straight white dude, um, you know, I have no direct experience to match Audrey Lorde's, right? And I do, I will admit, often feel a little bit, fun, like, I don't like the idea that I might be, um, what's the word, like, appropriating somebody else's experience, right? Um, and I try to be aware of that when I'm teaching something like this. But the fact that I haven't directly lived it, and it doesn't mean that I can't sympathize with it, right? And I think like we, we talk, like we can trace this back again to Adam Smith and this idea of developing imaginative sympathy as a key part of our moral development, right? that we can't really understand what we do to other people or how we behave towards other people unless we can put ourselves in the, imaginatively in their place. And the teaching texts that come from multiple cultural perspectives is one way that we can do this, right? Is one way that we kind of help ourselves imagine what things are like for other people. And thus, I would hope, become kind of more moral and more sympathetic. All right, so that is all I have for you today. We're about out of time. Let me give you the reading questions for Terry Tempest Williams. And then, yeah, go and gorge thyselves on turkey. <laughs>